Hey, what's up? It's Kevin Rogers. Welcome to Copy Chief Radio, brought to you by CopyChief.com. See how that works. Let's get into it. Hey, what's up? It's Kevin Rogers. Welcome back to Copy Chief Radio here with Kyle Milligan. Just getting to know Kyle and really impressed with this guy. He's doing a few things that I am a fan of, and I think he's doing them like really instinctively. First of all, he's a great copywriter, and that is evident. Uh, he doesn't need me to call him that because it's in the numbers. Created millions and millions of dollars at Agora Financial with his promos in just a short time there. And he'll tell us about his his journey there and his work with Agora Financial. I know a lot of you listening would love to someday work as a financial copywriter and work with some of the big publishers. So Kyle's going to give us some cool insight into that. And he's also been making a series of uh, Facebook live videos that he's turned into a YouTube channel. And I love his reason for doing that. We're going to get into that as well. Kyle, thanks for being here, brother. Hey, thanks so much for having me. What is up, Copy Squad? <laughs> What's up, Squad? That's your name for your, um, that's what you, how you start your videos, right? What's up, Copy Squad? We had the Agora open house recently and they were like, Kyle, you want to tell us about yourself? And I, I took the mic and I said, what's up, copy squad? <laughs> like, It's become like a habit. It's sort of branding. And it's just like a fun, it like immediately creates community when you recognize it. They're like, ah, copy squad. <laughs> right. Yeah, that's fun. I never noticed that. I always say, hey, Kev Rogers here. And so somebody, people started may, saying it back to me. You know, I'm like, oh, I didn't even realize I say that, you know. Right. It's like an in-group thing. Like you're part of the Kev Rogers club and <laughs> fan group or whatever. Right. So I want to, there's a lot of cool stuff we're going to talk about, but I think the forefront on my mind is your obsession with A&W Diet Root Beer. <laughs> it's, I drink too much coffee and I had to find something. Actually, it was my girlfriend that brought it into the house and I was like, I can't have any more caffeine. <laughs> so I like started drinking that and... Yeah, man, I I, did, I thought I would not like it, but it's you got to give it a shot, man. It's it's soft stuff. <laughs> <laughs> and about how many of those do you go through a day? Are we talking a six pack here, or what kind of what kind of help, level of help do you need? Dude, it really depends if I'm working from home or not. But it's easy to kill like uh, like four or five in like a sitting. Like wow, it's just the carbonation, you know? It's, yeah, you're, you're not addicted to the drink; you're addicted to the carbonation. It's the fizz, man. <laughs> So you live in uh, Boca Raton, Florida, mm -hmm. and which is uh, close to Delray, which is where some of the Agora action takes place. But you work with Agora Financial, who's based out of Baltimore. Mm -hmm. What does that look like for you now that you, so you went through copy school. Tell us how you got hired and, and how all that went down with Agora Financial. One thing that I think is super important and like one of the main messages I try to convey in my story is I accidentally found Agora Financial and I wasn't like a copy genius or like knew what I was doing. And I think that's really important for people who think like you need, like people will be like, I need an edge or I need this or I need that. And it's like, you'd be surprised, man. Like you just need to take action. I actually found Agora Financial through your interview with Joe Schrafer. Mm. My original plan was he's talked about this copy camp is like at the time, I think it was like eight week program or something. And he said, oh, He'll fly you out. He'll train you for eight weeks and you can learn how to write copy. And I was, I wanted to be like a work from Homer or something like that. And I wanted to make money online. So I was like, okay, now that that's my mindset. I'm going to go get this copy camp training. Mm. I'll learn how to do that. And I'm going to quit or just walk out or whatever, take that training. And I'm going to go do uh, work from home. I'm going to be a freelance copywriter was the game plan. So I want to like really, really hammer down on how naive I didn't even know what Agora Financial was, right? <laughs> I didn't have copywriting experience. I was just going to go take this uh, copy camp and get all this free knowledge or paid knowledge even. Yeah. So I get there though. And one of the, before copy camp even starts, one of my first meetings is with James Altucher, hmm. who incidentally, when I heard your podcast, I was listening to Choose Yourself, the audiobook, And I was like, oh man, I get to meet James Altucher. <laughs> And that's only kind of like the whole thing kind of blew up for me. I was like, oh, wow, Agora is like a really big deal. There's a lot of important people walking around here, people who I whose names I recognize. Yeah. So a lot of people think like you've got to be like a master already. And I just want to hammer down the point. Like I really want to harp on it. No, it really just starts with taking action. Yeah. One of my favorite quotes is from Stephen Pressfield. It's stay stupid. And I think that's like so important. Like being naive actually 
can be an asset because I just was like, give me a job, Joe Schrafer. I want to come get that copy camp from you. <laughs> That's so funny. It worked out. And so what do you think made him hire you? What did you have to do to, you know, at least at least show him something to want to, because this is, like you said, a paid position. It's not like he just let you hang around. I did have on the phone sales experience previously i did do a a stint selling on uh selling on the phones and i knew from selling on the phones it was really easy to sell when you just ask like some very basic questions like why did you call what did you hate about the thing before you called me like why are you trying to change now Mm -hmm. like what did you love about it and those kinds of things and in your interview with joe he specifically lists the qualities he's looking for so i emailed him and he gave his email address and i simply said Hey, that thing you said, number one, yeah, that's me because X, Y, Z. And that thing you said, number two, oh, that's also me because X, Y, Z. And it wasn't like he made me work for it. He told me what he was looking for. So I just said, oh, perfect. I'm all those things that you want. <laughs> yeah. And then the funny thing is he did not respond. Okay. Now, this is another thing about being stupid. Had I known who I was talking to, I probably would have approached this completely differently. I had no idea who this guy was. So he didn't answer me. So a week or so later, I just send him another email. I hit reply and I type the words BUMP, B-U-M-P in all caps. <laughs> like, like, bro, like Top email. of your inbox. <laughs> yeah, that's great. That's great. And he, he does. He responds. He's like, oh, hey, Kyle, uh, what, what what kind of like, are you interested in maybe moving to Baltimore or we have an office in Delray? And I was like, oh, Delray for sure. And he put me in touch with Evaldo. And that's kind of how it started. And again, uh-huh. totally just naive and just staying stupid. Not on purpose, even. <laughs> that is great. So, are you? Is that who you work with, Evaldo? So, you, you work in Delray mostly? It's been an evolving process. I got hired October 2nd of 2017. And I remember that day because I promised myself, because I like, to, I like to do too many side hustles, like the Facebook Lives and the YouTubes. And I said, if I take this job, I have to commit to a year. And really, because when I realized what Agora was, I was like, I should take this seriously. This is a really big opportunity. All right. So, when that dawned on me, I was like, stop doing all the other side stuff. Don't try to go be a freelancer for now. Sit here and learn because these guys are really, really smart and they really know what they're doing. Yeah. So I got hired in October. That's before we had the uh, the imprints that we now have. Mm-hmm. So they basically split Agora into four groups. And Evaldo was my copy chief. And we were, quote, quote, floaters for a little while. And then Evaldo took a position as one of the team's copy chiefs at Paradigm. So I worked with Evaldo pretty much exclusively for like my entire first year. And that's where I learned a lot about copy was that mentorship that working yeah. under him, cause he is a copywriting just phenom. Yeah. Like he's yeah. just, he's crazy. But now technically I decided to, I kind of insisted upon my sovereignty and not joining one of those teams. And I do still float no longer technically working with Evaldo or quote, quote, the Delray office. I kind of am now a remote copywriter. I'm, there's not very many like this. And Joe is not a big fan of this. He's not a big fan of like uh, having folks just floating around and freelancing. He actually really likes the team thing, but I've, I've kind of made my case and proven that I'll still work hard and, and be an asset. You know what I mean? Yeah, totally. So a lot of people come into that. It's interesting how you, you, you had this other motivation. Like what, when did it click over that? Oh, I want to do this now. I mean, I guess you technically are a freelancer in Agora as one of your clients, or do you feel like you're sort of full time with them under contract? I am a W two employee of Agora you Financial. Are. Okay, all right, cool. So, so then, so at what point we, we did you let go of your original motivation to get just sort of steal this education and run <laughs> and <laughs> and see the bigger opportunity of 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 st- sticking around with them? You know, I really think it. It did come when they said James Altucher was going to be, we're going to fly to Baltimore and hang out with James Altucher. And when I got in the office and we had like, you know, we do the Agora copy calls are on Tuesday. And I looked through the guest list Mm -hmm. and it was a pretty quick, like, wow, look at the names in here. I've, I've, I've heard this guy's name. I've seen that he has a podcast. I've read this guy's books. And it was like, um, these are people that I'll be like crossing paths with in the Baltimore office. And it was like immediately that I realized this was not just another job. Right. And as soon as gotcha. like that, I saw those names and stuff. I was like, I need to stay here. This is the end game. I realized like I'm already where I wanted to go. <laughs> I'm hanging out with the big shots. Right, right. And what about your writing? How, how did you said, you know, working with Evaldo, 
What does a mentorship look like? I think a lot of people wonder, uh, you know, how often are you interacting? How much are you writing? And is he reviewing that, that stuff? Early on, like I said, I was pretty, uh, <laughs> I was a pretty green, right? I wasn't like I was a, I wasn't like a student of copy and I wasn't like a great copywriter. Yeah. It was a lot of him. Like I remember like my first promo was the hottest IPO, which was, it turned out good. But the first draft was basically like, there was a red line that started at like Dear Reader and the red line continued till basically by now. <laughs> so <laughs> it was like, <laughs> just, why don't you just, just start a few, over? Kyle? Just a few notes. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, like that's how it went. That, I probably wrote that promo. I wrote it like three times before it got to uh, our legal compliance team and it was the Uber IPO and the legal compliance was like, well, you can't say Uber. So we had to rewrite the whole promo oh, okay. again. Wow. So working with Evaldo um, and the mentorship, it's definitely hands down the most single most important and impactful thing that happened was that direct one on one with someone who's had so many reps and so much success that he's he's able to like shortcut all the things that I was doing wrong and say, well, I've already made all those mistakes for you. Like he's been in the game for like a decade. Yeah, I think that's really important, too. Another thing I want to hammer down is don't feel like you have to be a genius or already have your stuff in a row to be a good copywriter. It'll come. Mm -hmm. uh, a mentor is very important. And the other thing is, um, I think a lot of people frown upon getting a copywriting job. Like, like I know freelancing is very like, uh, you have your sovereignty and, you, and you're on your own, you're doing it. But I think it's really important that if you can go somewhere where people will expect you to fail and like, you know, that's okay. And you can, you can learn quickly and fail quickly. I think that sometimes can be a more conducive path to learning. Then if you fail as a freelancer, perhaps you lose that client forever. Yeah. Uh, I just don't like the idea that getting a job should be frowned upon. And I know we have like a gung-ho entrepreneurship sort of world right now. I think like it's just such a shortcut to be able to get that job where these dudes have done it, man. And they're so smart. Yeah. Like I, I think that that's definitely been the, like, it, what was it like for me? A lot of editing and a lot of pain <laughs> from those red lines. But those are mistakes I didn't have to make with a client or something like that, where it might be like earth shattering or like yeah. this thing bombs or blows up in my face. I like that. That's a really good point. Yeah, there's safety and you're allowed to learn and grow and make mistakes. And they see your failures as, you know, a step towards where they want you to ultimately be. Where mm -hmm. you're right, as a client, it's like, how dare you fail? Like I paid you not to fail. <laughs> right? I mean, it can be you know, yeah, it's very intimidating. It's high pressure. I mean, both are good. And there's ways you could you could hedge that in the beginning. I always, you know, tell freelancers, it's like, man, you know, the, just be honest. Like the reason you'll lose sleep over gigs is because you probably overpromised. And, you know, if you're just really honest with where you are and you're working with clients that you can actually deliver for, pressure shouldn't be that great. I have a question for you then, sir. All right. So one of the things that I think is really important, and this might be an opinionated thing that I might not, I'd love to get your perspective because you've been in this way longer than me, is I feel like it's probably like important to not like figure out what it is that makes you credible. I think credibility is so important. Mm -hmm. And, you know, let's say there's a fine line between, you know, maybe credibility and overpromising, right? So right. you're saying like, I am a credible source. That's, that sort of is a promise inherent in itself, right? And for me, when people talk about their pitch or send me some copy, like this is what I was going to use for a client, one of my biggest pet peeves personally is when I see them say, I'm new to the game and like to get my feet wet. Right. And I know there's, there's two sides that like tell them you're going to work for free because you're new. And for me, I feel like, well, if it's my business, I want to hire someone very capable. So you need to establish that you're credible and capable. Right. I wouldn't come out of the gate and say, I'm new, so let me work for you for free. Right. What do you think? Yeah, 100%. I agree with that. I, I don't believe in ever working for free or at least presenting it that way. So, for instance, yeah, the, and you're right. This is, a, this is a conundrum that it's important to think right about and maneuver through. So, you know, it's what I call the, the confidence conundrum where you have to have your work implemented and measured for you to a understand w whether it was or wasn't effective and b have some braggable results so you can confidently go promote yourself right and be the the adult in the room as my friend john carlton says and that's why you'll get paid the big big bucks and it, you know when you don't have that experience it's, it's really hard to do that and so a couple things one is I think you should start with gigs 
where you, if you just want to prove the model that aren't necessarily the results of your work aren't going to affect the client's bottom line in a huge way, right? Mm -hmm. So if you don't put yourself in a circumstance, so for instance, like I, to me, the worst thing you could do is set out to try to master long form sales copy out of the gate without being in a situation like you're in Kyle, where you had mentors, right? That, that big red right. line right. You know, from the, the top to the bottom of the thing. And imagine, so the, people will go uh, on ClickBank, you know, and, and say, yeah, I can write your ClickBank launch copy. They bullshit that they've got all this experience and there's just no possible way they can nail that. You know, they might get lucky and it may not completely tank, but the, even that's rare. But the problem is you could find prospects there who don't uh, know the difference. It, it might kind of look like copy to them. And what do they know? They got it cheap. So hopefully it'll work. Right. All right. But when you do that, you know, what are the principal factors of really successful freelancers is that they care a lot about getting results for their client just instinctively. Right. There are people who like to show up, follow the pro code, build a reputation for themselves, and they just instinctively care how their relationships go. And so they typically will not over promise what they can't deliver. But when I say be honest, I don't mean diminish the the value you bring to the project. What my version of being honest is this and say, look, if somebody says to you, well, it seems like you know, I like you, I can tell you've studied, you know, say it's you're looking to sell emails. I can tell mm -hmm. you you're pretty good at writing emails. I saw your samples, but you know, I'm talking to a few other people who have a lot more experience. And I would say, you know what? I appreciate that. But the reason I can give you the price, you know, I, I'm offering you is because I need that experience. And I can tell you that the advantage of working with me is that I'm not going to take anything for granted. And I'm also not going to bring beliefs I learned on other projects into your project. We're going to work together collaboratively to make sure we nail this together. And no one is going to work harder than me to get you the result because I need this result more than other people, right? So if you're just really sincere and honest with people, and then they might still say no, hey, sorry, I need the experience. I can't risk it with you. Or I don't have time to collaborate with you. Fine. But much better to be honest and go into it in that scenario. And character is as much of this is uh, experience. And so it's just about finding a good match and not trying to lie your way into getting, you know, trusted with somebody's money and failing on them. So I think that's a really good point. And I, that's one of those things where, okay, I can kind of say this from like my sales experience, getting this, the job with Joe and Agora Financial. One of the things that I consider or wonder about is, can you do both? Can you A, be authentic? and not lie and be honest, that's A. And then B, not necessarily have to say, I'm green, right? And I think one of the ways that you can do this, and this is the way I kind of try to preach or tell people who ask me about it, and, I'm, and I ask you because I'm not the freelance getting expert, man. I got, my first thing was a job. And this is just my experience as a copywriter and a persuader that this is, seems like the best thing, the, the way I would probably approach it. And I, I try to encourage people who ask me questions like that to focus on your strengths. And I, I don't feel like you need to bring it up. And I see a lot of times people say it doesn't actually come up like how many years of experience. So like I told Joe my strengths, like uh, he said, I want someone who's insanely curious. And I was like, Joe, I'm insanely curious. I read everything. My girlfriend got me a technical SEO book for Christmas. I said, I guarantee you that would end up with some families throwing like lamps against the wall. If you got some like, <laughs> SEO book for Chris, I put that in my email, you know, so. <laughs> right. I, it has nothing to do with copy, right? I use an SEO book to sell my curiosity. And then, right, right. you know, I, I can't write copy, but I did sell stuff on the phone for a minute. Like, right, you know, right. so. Yeah, you're, you're, you're honest, right? And, and again, so here's another good example. You have to remember this other thing too. Like the, the freelancing is such a big world, right? The world you're in is very specific where it's like, I just want to be great. Can Joe size me up and see that I've got, at least two of the three to four to five things he sees as the the main criteria of a high performance copywriter for him, right? And if so, 
he's playing, and he'll tell you this, a numbers game, right? He's bringing 10 people into copy camp. And if he, hopefully 50% or higher will become long-term copywriters with them. But it's, you know, a rare set of circumstances that produce what you've been able to do with them, right? To the Mm -hmm. point now where you have special privilege to be a floater and those kinds of things. Like that's what he's looking for. And he knows Joe's a really smart guy and he's open-minded and has good instincts for people that even if he can't see it in the work you can produce at the moment, he sees something in the you that's teachable, that's hungry, that's smart, right? The fact that you have done, most people don't want, if somebody wouldn't do sales on the phone, even for a minute, they can't be a, a copy, a financial copywriter. Like they have to have some sales instinct or not be scared of that at least. Right. right. But in the big wide world of freelancing, you got to realize, man, like if you're studying even one way to a write persuasive copy to the point where you could call yourself some level of expert, you probably know more about how to do that well than the average online business owner or product creator or course creator or any of those things or health coach, right? right? Because they're great at doing what they do and they're not necessarily great marketers. For instance, say webinars. If you were really obsessed with what makes a webinar sell, and you read all of Jason Fladlin stuff and all of Joel Irway stuff, and you studied and you attended like a hundred webinars and took notes, man, aren't you more qualified to write a killer webinar that's going to sell than the average business owner, right? And that to me is the, the kind of expertise they should be looking for. And you're right. If you know enough about your topic and can talk in detail about why high converting webinars do well, then they're not going to question how many you've actually written or been a part of. And if they do, you can say, hey, look, this is this is an obsession of mine. And, you know, you could go ask Joel Irway what it would cost for him to write your webinar, or you, you and I can work together on me implementing everything I can tell you someone on his team would do because I've studied it inside and out, right? Again, it's just like finding the people who are willing to take you up on that. But man, you know, the, the, the learning is there from us. If you want to become an expert on any particular part of copywriting, it's not that hard to become an expert and to practice it enough to get really good and have good samples and feel capable if you're given the opportunity. Wow, that's really good stuff. We'll be right back to that conversation. I want to quickly tell you about Copy Chief, the membership, the full load. The mother load. What goes on in there? You can get your copy reviewed by working pro copywriters. We do new trainings every month based on the stuff that's proven, tested, and working best in the market today. Not just copy, Facebook ads, webinars, all the stuff that you need in your funnel to optimize your sales. You're getting it in real time from the real pros inside of Copy Chief. Go to copychief.com forward slash join and see what we got for you. Now, back to this amazing conversation. I had a, someone message me the other day. Like they had, they said, I got XYZ dollars to spend. Uh, what product should I buy? Mm. And I was like, why do you want a product first? I mean, I need to know your motivation. Mm. And this circles back to your point. Like he said, well, I want to edge on copywriters. And I was like, what are you talking about? There's so much free information out. There's, there's so many resources. Like you could become an expert on a topic without spending a dollar. Mm-hmm. There, there is so much stuff out there where if you want, if you, especially if you specialize, like it's crazy, man. Uh, there are people who have been doing it since what, like the, you know, the eighties and nineties. Yeah. Well, I would say, have the internet, YouTube, and all that stuff. Yeah, like well, you're right. You're right. I mean, I think the thing they're asking you for, though, really, in that situation, and I know this from running, you know, doing trainings for five years and having a community, is they want to be, even if they think they know how this might work, they want it validated, right? What I tell people is like, okay, step one. So if a, a new freelancer comes to me and says, what should I be learning? I'd say, well, figure out what you like writing first. Here's what I tell people is not to start with long form sales copy first. And the reason is, man, think about how, what you've been through, you've got a Valdo 
who's been called the best working copywriter right now, right? Sure. Uh, he's super top level. You have direct access from him. He's coaching you through your crappy first drafts to, to get to the gold. And imagine if you don't have someone like that and you're trying, like how much you'd have to learn just to be able to put out, pump out your first bad draft, right? Then right. find somebody to actually critique it then implement all the notes they gave you, then ask them to critique it again. This would take months. Whereas you could take a thing like an email sequence or advertorials or Facebook ads, and it's much shorter copy and it's much easier to have it reviewed by someone credible. And it's much easier to apply the changes and actually develop your education. Plus, pretty easy to put those things out on the Facebook with a few dollars and test them to see how they actually convert, right? Right. So, so you're right that there's a lot of information, a lot of ways to get going if you wanted really at no cost. But then I think what people want from there is to be around people who actually do know who they can trust as a valid source to say, yeah, you're getting it. No, change this and sort of accelerate their learning with a, with a more sure expert from there. Yeah, if if we weren't on the the Copy Chief podcast right now, I was like, this is the perfect time to plug the Copy yeah, Chief. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> I know. Uh, I, I'm a, as I'm saying that, I'm going. Am I only saying this because? Uh, <laughs> but it's but it, but it is true because, it, like I said, I think you make a really good point. It's like that's why I I don't judge people on how much experience they have. It, it, dude, if I meet somebody, and this is why your experience at Agora doesn't surprise me. It's impressive, but. Joe saw in you the same thing I see in you or I see in a lot of copywriters. It's like, I can tell in a five minute conversation if they have a future because all they really need to be is obsessed and have taken ownership of their obsession to the point where they're educating themselves, right? So mm -hmm. if they're like, yeah, I, I, I haven't written anything yet uh, uh, for a client and I don't even know if I'm ready for that. But aside of that, they can totally speak the language and have a conversation with me about it, which shows me how much effort they've put into educating themselves. And I go, you know, this is not a normal thing for the average person to want to learn about and become mm -hmm. educated on. And so that alone is the first step of qualifying them as someone with a future. I, on that note, that reminds me of a question I got one time. Like someone sent me a message and I probably disregarded their question now in hindsight, but they were like, hey, man. I'm so-and-so, I'm not ready to write. I think that's kind of like what you said. I'm not ready to write for anybody. I'm just practicing. Mm -hmm. And I think that's something I, I, I basically ran with that. I was like, hold up, hold up, hold up. You're just practicing. <laughs> I was like, don't ever think, I, wanna, I don't know why it came to my mind. I was like, don't ever think that you're ever going to feel ready. Like, mm. don't ever, every time I sit down to write a sales letter, I feel like it's the first time of, I just feel like, man, mm -hmm. it feels like climbing a mountain all over again. Like there's, I wanted to just tell him, like, dude, we're all out here practicing. Like, mm -hmm. I'm hoping this next letter I write isn't a bomb, right? Yeah. Like, I just wanted to, like, put in his brain, like, I understand that you feel like you're not ready, but if that's what you're waiting for, you're going to be <laughs> waiting. Yeah. You're going to a long, long time. time. Right, exactly. No, <laughs> it's so true, dude. And same with imposter syndrome. It's like people go, oh, man, I got this imposter syndrome. And, it, uh, and I go, you know what? Good news, bad news. Number one, bad news never goes away. Good news is then you don't have to worry about it <laughs> because it's just always <laughs> going to be there. And like, you know, I'm fortunate to know the best of the best in this business. And I've had a conversation with every single one of them about a bouts of imposter syndrome, even at the highest levels. And it may not be, oh, I don't know if I can pump out the level of copy I need to. It's like, I don't know if I understand this market or I don't understand this, this new way of traffic generation that I... I'm a part of, you know what I mean? Like yeah. it, it, there's so many facets now to how direct response works. We're all students and we're all learning and we're all aware that we're, we could be humbled at any minute. You know, it's interesting, dude. It reminds me there's so many parallels between stand up comedy and copywriting. But one of the interesting ones that I, I only realized now that I came back to comedy after being a copywriter for so long was how humble we are before the show. <laughs> and it's just like before the launch, right? Uh -huh. it, it's like after you you go up and you kill and you come off, you're like cocky and uh, you feel like, of course, man, I killed. But if you could 
look at comics energies before they go on stage and after they come off, it's completely different because before they go up, no one's being cocky. No one's being arrogant. Like, you know what I mean? Like they're reciting their lines or going over yeah, their skit. in their head. Like, you know, not to don't really mess with them. Don't talk to them, give them their space because you mm -hmm. know where they're at. And then when they come off, they either feel 10 feet tall or, or two feet tall and whatever, man, it's on to the next one. And it's, it's, it, copywriting is a lot like that. It's like, I never met a good copywriter who thinks they have this figured out or they'll, they're always going to nail it, you know? Yeah. That's like, you can, you can learn the influence triggers. You can learn, you can read persuasion and influence and all that stuff. And implementing it is all about, I mean, there are so many, it's like a, it's like a soup of timeliness and being able to create exciting, relatable things that, you know, get your prospect motivated and yeah. it's a mess. <laughs> yeah, it's a, it's Having a, it figured yeah. out, it's like a myth. It's a myth, right? Because there's so many factors, like you said. Yeah, I mean, I, you know, my big breakthrough project was the copy was good, but it was a perfect storm, like of all the elements. The timing for this offer was so perfect. The guru, who was actually an 18-year-old kid, was the perfect person for it. We really nailed the hook and, and all those things. But, you know, we had one part of, of this perfect storm. And just, and I've had other projects where everything felt perfect and it just tanked, right? And yeah. so, yeah, that's how you can tell the real pros, man. They're, they're not cocky and they want the harsh critique because they want to consider every potential objection or catastrophe before they start feel anything like confident to pull the trigger. You do need a slight, like, like lean towards like masochism, like <laughs> yeah. destroy my copy. Like yeah. tell me where this gets boring and be brutal about how boring it is to you. Because that's the only way that you're going to know. Like I, I, I the, the project I'm working on now, right? Like I kind of knew I had like an idea, like this is a cool gimmick I've got in my brain. And I started writing it and I put it in. My girlfriend is my favorite person because she's not like a marketer per se. She gets it now. Mm -hmm. So she's kind of losing her edge. Like right. she's using She's losing her usefulness. The curse because, of knowledge is, yeah, yeah. setting in. Yeah. She started, she's like, okay, all I see is like proof, proof, open loop. And I'm like, no, no. I was like, is it exciting? She's like, it just looks like copy to me now. And I was like, okay, well, first thing, no. That If you say that, that means it's not exciting, right? Even, even if you understand copy, there are things that when you read it, you can't help but get excited, right? And so I always like to put it in front of her before I go anywhere else with it. And I came, I said, okay. I said, well, this isn't exciting enough. And she said, no, no, it's because I get copy now. And I was like, N that's n that doesn't make, no, nah, that's not how it works. Like if it works, like if it, if it does the job it's supposed mm, to do, yeah. you are helpless. That's it a is a point. emotional yeah. reaction. So mm. I took that draft and I threw it right in the trash, right? There's, there's a couple of days of work just deleted. And, and that's the thing. Like I didn't try to make it work. I didn't try to like, oh, and maybe it's this line. no. That, that idea did not resonate. Yeah. And I, I came back. I was like, I think I know what was wrong. Here, take a look at this one. And she was like, oh, wow. She's like, this is so much better. She's like, mm -hmm. I, I, I actually want to know what this IRS ruling is that you're talking about. I don't give a shit about the IRS, you know? Yeah. Um, I was like, well, that's it. That's, then that's the angle we're going to run with. Yes. And I think you do it to be like brutal, like, yeah. don't marry that copy if it doesn't work like be quick i've deleted pages and pages from promos where the publisher was just like why are we talking about this right now and i don't even like the second guy take a big pen and i just write a big x on that okay i like i'll delete that yeah that's great man that's a really i love what you said about you cannot factor in no i'm just i, I understand copy now you're right it doesn't matter like you should mm -hmm. I love what you, how did you put it? Like you should be, you def should, you're defenseless. You should be helpless. You should be helpless, you should be helpless, Hel helpless help against good copy. That's, that, that's yeah. great, dude. Oh man, you got me excited. This turned into <laughs> like a <laughs> dual interview. This is great, dude. I do want to talk about, you said something I loved earlier before we got on. We talked about your, your social media stuff. You, did you just commit to doing so many Facebook videos, like one a day or something? Like how did you rack up 500 or whatever you did? Yeah. So I think I'm at like a little over a hundred and I don't know, it might be 140 at this point. I'm not okay. sure exactly, but it started with, I know at the beginning of this interview, I said, I got hired October 2nd, 2017. I know that 
because I made a deal with myself for one year, no side hustles. And I told you that is a problem for me. I really love to stay busy and do side hustles. Mm -hmm. So October 2nd, 2018, I started a YouTube channel and I didn't know what I was going to do. I actually had a choice. I was either going to do like a video game streaming thing, which is pretty hot right now, or, and I think that's another thing, like people, people also hate on like uh downtime. People want to be like gung-ho entrepreneurs, like boo, like they, they poo-poo on people who get jobs, poo on jobs. And then they also say poo-poo on anyone who plays video games. You're, you're, you, what a waste of time. Like I debunk both of those, like get a job where you can learn. And if video games is how you like to relax, more power to you. Yeah. So I was like, okay, I'm either going to start a copywriting channel or a video game channel. And the idea was these are two things I'm already doing. How can I monetize or how can I turn them into content? Every night I play about, let's say, an hour or two of unwind video game, probably like an hour a night of video games. And I'm also reading a promo frequently. This is something I learned from Joe is he says read a promo a day, write a page a day, come up with an idea a day. I've gone a little vaguer and said read a piece of copy because that takes me hours to read a promo. I really dissect it. So I either am reading, I every day I kind of do this. So I was like, okay, well, let me just videotape myself breaking down these promos. And it came out to be about an average of two hours and 20 minutes for me to break down a promo. Hmm. And I decided that the copywriting channel is a lot easier for me to sell in the long run. Okay. Mm -hmm. So I was like, okay, we won't do the video game thing. I have to buy all this equipment. I don't really understand how to stream. I was like, let me just record myself breaking down promos. And during this, I, it starts to pick up steam. I don't have any clue how I got people to tune in to my first live video of me breaking down. a. I have no clue how people ended up there, but some people did. Mm -hmm. And I started an email list. And I think that's what got people first to get to look my way or be interested is I started saying, hey, I got a swipe file. I got a swipe file of all this million dollar copy. I'll give it to you for free. People got on the email list. I was like, watch me on YouTube breaking down more promos. And then I, I came across Frank Kern. Frank Kern made like this glorious comeback in the last couple months from obscurity. I hadn't heard of him in a long time. And he was all of a sudden like a big, big pusher for social media as like an advertising medium. And his big thing was uh, intent based branding and going live every day. So I was like, okay, I see Frank Kern doing it. He seems to be making money. I'm going to give it a shot. So I started going live every single day. And I think the question that you were kind of getting at from the start was, why are you doing this? <laughs> Well, yeah, like what, 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 yeah, what's the point? <laughs> right. I think that's the thing that I was supposed to say here and I just kind of got in a no, rant. No, 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 but... no, it makes sense. I wasn't questioning why you did them. I guess I was just asked, what I asked you directly is, is your goal to start coaching or, you know, what, what do you, why the teaching? Right, exactly. So what's the end game, right? Yeah. This is the thing that I think you liked was, um, the, the reason I started doing this was I didn't have a goal. And people, especially since I'm in the direct marketing space, kind of almost scoff at this, like how, what, you know, right now, now I have stuff that I pitch on the, on the videos. But when I first started, it actually came from this place of this book I read called uh, Never Eat Alone by Keith Ferrazzi. And one of the things that he said in there, and this is my weakness, this is my weak point. I think this is like my first like real interview about copywriting. And I'm, I'm in a position where I could get interviewed like nonstop. I've been on Jake Hoffberg's uh, Facebook group a couple of times, but I have connections, right? Like I, I have people that I could, I could be interviewed once a day by big names or something like that, but I'm terrible at the networking side of it. So I read a book, you know, hopefully trying to get better. Yeah. And I was never eat alone by Keith Ferrazzi. And Keith says, uh, build your network before you need a network. Mm -hmm. And I was like, okay, uh, I don't know. I don't have a product to sell. I don't really have any real goal or end game, but I do know that Keith says I should build a network. And I know that I suck at networking. I usually just stay at my desk, type, go to sleep, play video games before bed. You know, I did that. Like I was like, okay, I'm going to build the network. I started building an email list. I started just creating content and giving away the swipe file. No, I had, I had no end game. The end game was to just uh, build a network, build a list. Yeah. So that's, you know, what I love about that dude is that that's the same reason I, I started doing it, you know, 10, 12 years ago. My thing was, I think I was lonely. <laughs> like when I, when I look back, you know, and I was so on fire for copywriting and specifically I studied John Carlton a lot. Right. And so mm -hmm. I would come across like a, a, a book by Roy Peter Clark on just general writing or journalism stuff. And I would take a lesson from that and I would combine it with a piece of uh, uh, John's 
nickel letter, you know, and I, and I'd write a post about that. And I was just, it was fun for me. And I think I was, that's, what do they say? You teach what you need to, to learn. Right. And that's essentially what I was doing with my blog. And like, you, like you're finding it just somehow people found it and were subscribing to it. And next thing I know, I had a few hundred and a few thousand subscribers. Right. And yeah. it, 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 it wasn't until years later that I put any intention towards doing anything with that list. I think that's another, well, I could get on another rabbit hole here, but there, there's, it's interesting. I, I talk about there's the three paths of a successful freelance career or a copywriting career. And you're a perfect like two, three hybrid right now. So two is the, basically what I should call like the in-house, like leave me, they don't want to do the project management and all the stuff of a type one, which is like the all around freelancer, right? Type two is like, they're a perfect fit to be where you are right now, like in-house somewhere or partnered with one or two premier clients to get a specific result. Very collaborative, but don't necessarily need glory. Three is entrepreneurial by instinct and quickly will create their own offers or reasons for people to come want to give them attention and money. Mm -hmm. And I think I, like you, was, I was just obsessed. I just wanted to do the work of writing copy, but my budding entrepreneurial side realized that th there must be some value to making a name for yourself, right? And, wow. and the easiest content to ever come up with is to teach what you're learning because it's, it's written for you. It's already done. But yeah. there's something about being willing to share it and learning over, you know, you've done 140 or whatever videos. That's a lot of practice at just getting better at it, getting to the point, being interesting, uh, finding topics that resonate, things like that, you know? So good on you for doing it, bro. And I think a, a lot more freelancers should do it for the sake of doing it. And because it creates a lot of self-discovery, the process of it. I think that's another thing. A couple, a couple points to that. First off, having no goal, man, I didn't need permission. I think uh, one of the reasons people won't get on camera and start doing that is because they don't want to look foolish. Mm -hmm. Well, if you don't have a goal, you can't fail. I think, you know, that's kind of like the opposite advice of what people say. People say, you got to have a goal. Like without a goal, without a map, you can't get anywhere. That kind of thing is like classic advice. Mm -hmm. But if you're just trying to practice, one of the reasons that I was, I was making a list of reasons why I was doing it before I started, I was like, I was explaining to people, I was like, well, this will make me more honest about my breaking down promos more often. So I don't take days off because I have this YouTube thing going on. I'll, I'll do more work. I'll do more of what I'm supposed to do. So my end game wasn't, I need a thousand subscribers. My end game wasn't YouTube fame or for anyone to even care. You know, I didn't think anyone would want to watch me break down a promo for over two hours. That would seem... <laughs> <laughs> that seems so dry. <laughs> like, yeah. There's no way any. So for me, it was like, okay, I'm basically going to do this. I would, I would only do things that I was already doing. So I wouldn't like go out of my way to create content for the audience, which I eventually started to do. But it did start with like, I'm. This will be a reason for me to go live. And through that, I did. I developed the stuff that I basically have used. It's crazy because I've developed this whole system. It's like I call it new, easy, safe, and big. And it all came, if you go back to the very first couple videos, it doesn't exist. If you go back to videos like four and five, I start like coming up with all these things. I have like a whole list of things in the margin. And then if you go to like video 10, 11, 12, and of like the full promo breakdowns, you see the list get more concise, more polished. And people are like, how'd you come up with this? And it's like through doing it every single day it's like until it just made sense and it i didn't come up with it it kind of revealed itself to me and if you watch like the videos or something like that you see it like you see like it's a total mess to start but by the time i get to dissecting them today there's a process there's an order there's specific things to pull and look for that make it so much simpler yeah and it was actually it was actually rich sheffron so rich sheffron lives in delray beach and he works with us uh, at Agora Financial. We were having a cigar at a, at a bar right by the office. And I basically was telling him about this idea. And he told me he wanted to learn something. And the fastest way he's ever learned was he just offered a course. And he kind of said, like, it was like I, 
I learned so much because people came at me left and right yeah. from around the world with questions. He said, I was working like 12 hour days researching questions and answers. And basically it was like, I was learning more by teaching. Yeah. And he was one of the guys that kind of got me. I was like, okay, I'm going to do this. I'm going to do this. And he was right. He was right. My whole system came from just talking about it on YouTube. Like all I know. That. Yeah. There's, there's nothing more valuable in marketing, I believe, than the dialogue with your audience, right? Knowing somebody's paying attention, even a little bit, gives you that avatar to speak to. And then the more people who start responding, that instructs the um, the teaching. And like you said, that's what creates a system because it's based on this evolving thought you had or this evolving process to helping people get to what you found out thereafter. Like you said, the, one of the counterintuitive things about doing that is to just start when no one's listening, right? And like you said, like, you know, it's funny when you don't have a goal, which also means, you know, you don't have to tidy up the kitchen before you turn on the camera if you think no one's watching. <laughs> <laughs> so you don't have to obsess on what to wear and how it should look. You just do it, man. So um, you can find all of Kyle's stuff at kylethewriter.com. Go check him out. Subscribe to his YouTube channel. See his breakdowns. This is a guy who a few years ago didn't even consider himself a copywriter. Tried to steal an education from Joe Schrieffer. Ended up being someone Joe wanted to keep around, pay a bunch of money to and make a bunch of money together on the promos he's been writing. So this is a guy with fresh energy and fresh ideas, someone you want to be paying attention to. Kyle, I've really enjoyed this, man, and I think we'll be talking a lot more. Awesome. Thanks so much for having me. Again, this is, like I said, my first big interview or whatever you want to call it. And uh, just really honored to be on it, to be a person that uh, makes the cut. Yeah, brother. Well, you did great, man. I enjoyed it. Thanks again. Talk soon. Copy Chief Radio Copy Chief Radio